All right, we are on lesson 10. We finished up lesson nine last week and uh, looked at the uh, organization of the Lord's church and how it compares to organizations that man tries to incorporate into the Lord's church. Uh, this lesson, however, is contrasting the Lord's church with human organizations. And of course, all of this, each one of these lessons really builds upon each, each uh, they all build upon each other. And so they're, they're really linked. And so a lot of the, the points that, that we look at have been touched on maybe briefly before and vice versa. Uh, but starting with the introduction, in this lesson, we're not dealing with method, arrangement, or systematic procedure within the scope of divine authority but rather with other organizations than the church, organizations without and apart from the church, other bodies designed and established by the will and wisdom of men and controlled by human authority to do the work of the church. And I think there's a very important separation there to understand that human organizations are fine. There's nothing wrong with human organizations as organizations themselves. But when you're designing a, an organization to do the work of, or to try to supplement even the work of the church, you have an issue. Uh, Homer Haley kind of defined the, the difference between these things. An organization is a body of persons formed into a whole consisting of independent and coordinated parts, especially for harmonious or united action. A human organization would be such a body formed by man, governed by man, apart from divine origin or authority. And it's a really good definition because the first part applies to the church. It's a body of persons, as Paul acknowledges in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, or Romans chapter 12, that we are one body in Christ Jesus, consisting of independent and coordinated parts, but we're all united in purpose, we're united in the action of worshiping the Lord and fulfilling his will. But a human organization is that organization made up of people, but it's governed by man and it has no association with the divine origin or authority of God. Can the churches of Christ establish such organizations and maintain them as a means of cooperating and doing any of their work? That's the question that he asks and that's what the chapter or the lesson is based on. Any thoughts through that? All right. Uh, so point, the first point that he brings up, the church of the Lord contrasted with human organizations. Now, this point is all about showing the difference between the divine origin of how God established the church versus how man tries to supplement that as if the divine design of God isn't enough. Uh, he brings out the fact that the church is a divine organization for the reason that, and he goes through a list of, of points that from the, the New Testament, how that the church was given its design by God, and thus it's a divine organization. Man didn't make it up. Man didn't institute it. Man didn't come up with the ways in which it does things. God, through or Jesus, through the apostles, did that. Uh, one point that he, that he makes here at the end of this first point, he says, no human organization possesses any of the above characteristics. And of course, it can't. Because if it's, it can, if it's kind of comprised or, or um, uh, concocted, there we go, if it's concocted by man, then it's not going to be from God. And that's kind of the point. And certainly this also speaks to changing the Lord's church itself as well. That when you start fiddling with the design of what God has set up, then all of a sudden it's no longer God's design. Now it's man's design. But uh, as he points out, any kind of organization developed by humans, de developed by develop rules are made up of, the, the purpose is established by man, then it can't be of God. Any, any thoughts through that first point? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Well, and even, even within the realm of Christianity, yeah. I mean, you have so many different variations or different ways of doing things, even within Christianity, which speaks to a lack of appreciation of what? It, 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 what is it that if they recognized it, all churches would be exactly the same? The authority of God. Okay, that, that speaks to the lack of authority. It speaks to a lack of recognition or appreciation of God's authority. And staying within the authority of the scriptures, if all churches did that, 
then every church would be exactly the same. And that's the way it's supposed to be. In fact, Paul, he says that he's preached the same thing in every church. And so it's not like different churches, the, the actual design was different for each church based on the community, based on the people, or their personalities. No, it was all exactly the same in terms of organization and structure. Uh, and certainly when man starts you know, fiddling with it and starts adding things, well, but for our unique circumstances, we need to add this or we need to do this. And uh, obviously the church, there were no unique circumstances. Every church was exactly the same in its structure and definition and, and worship. Now, obviously, it wasn't the same in terms of its physical makeup. You had some with uh, majority Jews, Jewish Christians. Some had majority Gentile Christians. Some had needs of certain uh, physical uh, issues versus others who had maybe different issues. Some had needs of certain maybe uh, character or attitude type of adjustments, I guess you could say, in terms of how Paul treated the Corinthians how he refused to take money from the Corinthians, but he was willing to take money from other churches because something in Corinth about the brethren there, that was a stumbling block and Paul knew it was going to be. And so certainly there were differences in the, in the character makeup of the brethren, but all of the churches were exactly the same. Point two, God gave his church organic form, which is organization, to govern in its function. And I, I love that. I'd never heard that phrase before, organic form associated with the church. But I think it's really interesting and unique because, in essence, what does organic form recognize? What does it mean, organic form? Something alive or, by, or, or designed to be alive or to work. Okay, It's designed. And, and, of course, in our society, to say that we are living and we are organic form <laughs> doesn't mean that people acknowledge we are designed, does it? But the, the phrase organic form or to be designed by certainly speaks to that, that uh, effect. So I really like that phrase organic form. That might be kind of a, uh, an older generation phrase or something because I've, I've never heard that phrase before. But he gave his church organic form to govern in its function. Obviously, God is the one who gave the design. He gave the, the organization of it. Uh, and he brings up a couple of different points. First of all, he brings up how that he didn't leave the world without form. Uh, when he created all things, he created the universe. He gave order. He gave design. He gave direction. Nolan mentioned in his prayer, I think it was Wednesday night, the changing of the seasons and how that it kind of brings an order to our, to our year, to our lives, to recognize that with each coming of a new season it, it kind of it, it's different but it's the same because the same thing happened last year <laughs> you know and so all of these different uh, order or different rules that God has established in creation why would it be any different with his church Pam that could be yeah yeah that's a good point yeah if it's organic it means it's natural as opposed to anything added to it yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. But of course, of course, of course. Nowadays, you know, we've got organic milk, we got organic bread, we got organic stuff like that, and that that speaks to the fact that it's supposed to be completely natural with no preservatives and no additives and that sort of thing. It could be that that's the that's the idea too. And of course, both are true. By design, something that is natural doesn't have anything added to it. So, good point. Thanks, Pam. All right, but uh, one of the points that he brings up here is uh, the line starting with letter D, the line of distinction has been drawn by the divine will between that which is human in origin and that which is divine, whether in matters of faith, worship, or organization. And then under that, numbers two and three that he brings up, he says, human innovations established by the doctrines and commandments of men in matters of worship make it vain in God's sight here is the dividing line between true and vain worship. Now, I think it's important to remember, what did Jesus tell the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4? She says, our, our fathers say we got to worship on this mountain. Jesus says, behold, the day is coming when you will neither worship in Jerusalem nor on this mountain. But then he talks about what, what true worship or the worship of the Father is. Who, what does the Father seek? Those who will worship him in what? 
spirit, and in truth. Now, one applies to the attitude and the mindset. One applies to the, the literal, actual facts of the matter, okay? You have the spirit, according to spirit, that's the attitude, the mindset, the, the uh, character of those who are going to worship God. They're not just doing it to check a checklist or, or to, uh, to pay lip service, but they are actually there to worship God. And then according to truth, and of course in our society there is no real truth, it's whatever your lived experience is or your truth, but there is objective truth. And God says, or Jesus says, according to spirit and truth, but which is according to what God has said. And of course in Matthew chapter 15 and other scriptures as well bring up, uh, for instance, the prophecy from Isaiah, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, and uh, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. And this is one of the points that uh, Brother Cogdo brings up, that human innovations, and again, that this is specific, it certainly applies to things like instrumental music and things like that, but, but for our application for our lesson today, it's uh, added organizations attached to the church. And of course, application to this is going to come up here in a little bit. Um, and so, uh, number three that he brings out, contrast practices of human origin with practices or ways originating with God, here is the difference between the human and divine will, between the ways of man and the ways of God. Uh, and I, I think that there's certainly a lot of application in contrasting the two, because one hand, when man comes into the equation, he often claims it's for convenience or expediency's sake. That may or may not be true. But oftentimes, what is that simply a, uh, an excuse for? Well, this is just more convenient, so we're going to do it this way. What's that often an excuse for? I'll do it my way. I want to do what I want. Okay? Or as a collective, we want to do what we want. And we don't want to be restricted in the nature of the design of the church. We want to do this and we want to be to receive praise from the community for being a welcoming and inclusive and so forth. And so we are going to do this. But it's simply more convenient to get the word out. It's more convenient to be able to to get people to come in to sit in the pews. Uh, and so that's kind of often the the ways of thinking. Thoughts or comments through that. All right. Uh, and then he brings up under the letter F here, this principle is taught through the tabernacle as a type. He brings up the Hebrew writer and the fact that in Hebrews chapter 9 and, and really all of Hebrews describes the shadows of things to come. Uh, the, the, the physical tabernacle, which ended up dwelling in the temple, uh, the physical law of the Moses tended to represent the spiritual things in heaven. Uh, that's the, the, the or organization that God gave to Moses to represent those things in heaven. Uh, and under point five, he mentions this true, tra true tabernacle purged by the blood of Christ in Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 22, where Jesus went into the most holy and through his blood, therefore, we can come boldly to, to uh, the throne. We come boldly to, uh, uh, to into the presence of, of the father. And then he mentions as strictly as God charged Moses to follow the pattern and as plainly as we have this principle applied to the church today, it is unthinkable that God did not give order, arrangement, and form to this more perfect tabernacle, or that he left men the liberty of substituting their own arrangement for that which God gave or adding thereto. That's an excellent point, as specific as God was under the Mosaical law. I mean, there was very specific instructions for the Ark of the Covenant, how big it was supposed to be, what it was to be made of, how it was to be uh, transported. Could you put it on a new cart, for instance, and pull it by a donkey or an ox? No. Okay, Uzzah can attest to that. It's to be carried. The fact that the uh, tabernacle inside the, where the Most Holy was, what furniture, okay, what furnishings existed within the Most Holy, it was specific how the altar was to be set up, what sacrifices were to be offered, and for what sins. Those were very specific. Why would God go from having specific requirements under the old law 
to now not caring at all under the new law. That doesn't make any sense. Although for most people in our religious society, in their mind, is God, uh, the, the, God the Father of Jesus, the same God as Jehovah, the God of Israel? For most people, although they would certainly answer, of course, they're the same, they're not. In their mind, the God of the Old Testament, how is he characterized? Angry, mean, cruel, uh, fire and brimstone and so forth. That's how people characterize Jehovah in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, associated as the father of Jesus, how do they think of God in the New Testament? Love, kind, tolerant, forbearing, long-suffering are both true of Jehovah? Yes. But what gets missed is, was God also loving and tolerant and forbearing at times in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Absolutely he was. And in the New Testament, are there times where he's angry and uh, fire and brimstone as well? Yes. Yes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't associate the term cruel, obviously. That's how people think of how God did things in the Old Testament. But obviously... Even when God when he went through Ezekiel addressing uh, the people saying, your way's not fair, your way's not fair. And God says, your way is not fair. Now, I'm the one who determines what's fair. And ultimately, God is the one who determines that which is, is cruel. Man doesn't get to determine that. Uh, but people don't understand that it's the same God of the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. And so if God had specifics in the Old Testament, and we're not just talking, of course, remember the Old Testament is comprised of two laws. You've got the law of Moses, and what other law was, is contained in the Old Testament? The patriotic, or, or, or the um, um, law of Abraham, whatever you want to phrase that, uh, patriarchal law. Uh, and so having understanding that even under the patriarchal law, there were still rules, weren't there? There was even a priesthood wasn't there. There were sacrifices that were offered under the patriarchal law. And so why would God, un under the first two laws, have specifics, have direct design and requirements of those who wish to worship him? And then all of a sudden in Christ, there, there really isn't any specifics. Just kind of do what you want or how you want. As long as it has good intentions, as long as your goal is good by man's definition, then it's fine. And the point that he brings out here is really, it, it's uh, really a good contrast. Uh, he brings up Hebrews 2, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 12. We cannot conclude that we have greater liberty under the new covenant when it comes to following God's ways and doing his will. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Do we have liberty under the law of Christ? Has Christ set the captive free? Yeah, but what kind of liberty are we talking about? The, the opportunity to be free from sin, not the opportunity to be free from law. There is a big difference between the two. Because as Paul points out in the Roman letter, law still defines sin. No matter what law it was, patriarchal law. Did I say patriotic law before? I think I did. I said patriotic law before. Patriarchal law. Oh, patriotic. Patriarchal law before. The law of Moses, all of those, they defined that which was wrong. They defined that which was sinful. Well, does the law of Christ also define that which is wrong and sinful? Sure. This is what God expects. And if you don't meet that standard of righteousness, then you will not be saved. Well, that's just as blunt as you can put it. But in the end, the freedom we have is supposed to be from sin. If we are faithful to the Lord, it's not freedom from rules. And if you're going to talk about rules and, and design, it's not freedom to change God's design to do what you want. Or to assume, I think God will be happy with this. I think God will be okay with this. Well, in the end, God won't send us to hell because of this. I mean, Jesus brings up the situation, the hypothetical situation where there will be many uh, in Matthew chapter 7, there will be many at the day of judgment who say, Lord, Lord, look at all the things we did in your name. And these are people who are going to be religious people who believed in the name of Jesus because they did things in the name of Jesus. And yet Jesus 
says, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. You didn't have law in what you did. And I think that's a very important point to bring up to people because that term lawlessness, it's literally, the term means that which is without law. You had no authority. Law provides authority. You had no authority to do what you did. You may have believed in my name and you may have done many great things, great things defined by man, in my name, but you didn't do it according to what I told you. That's important to recognize the authority of God. If people are going to lose their souls over it on an individual basis, certainly that's going to apply to an entire congregation of people as well. Thoughts or comments through that? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in any application of man's law, you don't get to just decide, well, I'm going to redefine this and you don't get to throw me in prison or, or prosecute me because of it. Or I, I'm going to take liberties. I, I know you said this is how you want this done or, or this is what I'm supposed to do, but I think you'll be okay if we don't. We don't have that ability in man's law. At least we shouldn't, should say. Certainly God isn't going to allow that either. Anarchy, yeah. There'd be no point of government. There'd be no point of having law if that was the case. All right, the next point he brings up under letter G, the pattern of doctrine, worship, and work of the church is the same in all congregations. As we mentioned earlier, Paul brings up the Corinthians uh, that he pre uh, teaches the same thing in every single church. Uh, actually, uh, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1.13, he brings up the, the same uh, reference or understanding that, that all these things were taught in, the same, in all the churches. Uh, and under point three, no New Testament church ever built and maintained any human organization as a means of doing any of its work. And if we're going to talk about authority and that the silence of the scriptures okay, is authoritative, by that we mean if God didn't say it's okay or give example of it being okay, you've got to be, you got to step back and say, can I do it? Okay, Nadab and Abihu did that which God had not commanded them. God didn't have, does he have to go through the list of all the things not to do? Does God have to have, okay, here's what I want you to do. Oh yeah, and here's every single possible sin or possible thing you could possibly do that I don't want you to do. Does he need to do that? That, that's the nature of authority, is that if God says, here's what I want, by process of exclusion, it, 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 all the other is going to be rejected. This is what God wants. There's a, a, a million and one ways to lose your soul. How many ways to win it? How many ways to gain your soul? Just one. Okay, just as Paul points out, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father over all. Well, there's only one way. To be saved. And there's only one church. There's only one organization that is according to God's word. The Lord never gave the church authority to build anything but the church and to illustrate. And I think this is really interesting. He brings up a debate back in 1956. And uh, this is a really interesting point that, um, that, that I, don't, I don't think I, I don't even think I have. I have several books with, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, transcribed with the uh, debates and, and so forth in my office, but I don't think I have this one. Uh, it says, Brother Guy Woods at the debate in Indianapolis, Indiana in January 1956 used a chart similar to the above to contend that all the institutions on the left side of the chart build and maintain the organization, organizations on the right side of the chart, and none of them in any sense rival or compete with the institution that establishes them. So take a look at this chart that, that he offers. The federal government... It is its own organization. It created and, and keeps established the post office department, but the post office department doesn't rival or doesn't compete with the federal government. That's the point that, that Brother Woods made, apparently. State government, it creates the highway department, cr maintains the highways in, in each state, but it doesn't, doesn't uh, rival or compete with. The Masonic Lodge has homes for the elderly. The Catholic Church has children's homes. And of course, this isn't just to just Masonic Lodge or, or Catholic Church, certainly anymore. Uh, but these are some of the points he's making. Even so, his application is, therefore, the Church of Christ can create benevolent organizations. And those benevolent organizations don't rival or compete with the church. Therefore, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. 
That's, that's his point. That's, the try to, that's what he tried to, to say here. And I believe Brother Cogdell's, his, his response to this is really good. Uh, Brother Porter, who was debating Brother Woods, he says, showed that such logic would justify the churches of Christ building missionary societies as well as benevolent societies because the Catholic Church builds and maintains missionary societies that do not conflict or compete with it. Well, if you're going to put children's homes under the Catholic Church, well, they do missionary work as well. So why can't the Church of Christ also do children's homes and or orphans' homes, widows' homes, any other type of benevolent institution, have a, a soup kitchen downtown somewhere? I mean, why can't the church be involved in all of it? If you're going to say it can do a benevolent organization, why can't it do all the rest of it? Uh, the basic fallacy of Brother Woods' argument is in the fact that legislative authority is inherent in all of these organizations to build whatever they please, but it is not so in the church of God. And that's, that is, I mean, that is a fundamental basic principle that when you look at the federal government, state government, Masonic Lodge or whatever, uh, certainly Catholic Church shouldn't be, but it is, they, they do whatever they want, okay? Especially as it pertains to the government, they have the authority to legislate what they want to. They can create any kind of commission, any kind of department that they want to create. They have that ability, they have that right, and the authority to do that. But does anywhere in Scripture give the church the authority to create anything? Anything. Okay? The church cannot create anything. All right, well, I'm not talking about, we, we don't create worship, we worship. Okay, we don't create congregations necessarily. Okay, we establish congregations, but, but we're not creating in the sense that, it, that the design and the uh, it's coming from us, from our mind. The church has no authority to create anything, organization or otherwise. And I think that's a great point that Brother Cogba brings up. Jesus Christ is the head over his church, and it has no right to build anything that he has not authorized it to build. And of course, Paul in great length talks about in Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 24, uh, he talks about Jesus being the head of the church, uh, and thus the church uh, is to be in subjection and submission to Christ. We don't get to just up and decide what we're going to do, and Christ, you're going to get over it. That's not how it's established in Ephesians 5, much less Colossians 1 and, and so forth, Christ being the head of the church, which is the body. Any thoughts or comments through that? And, and ultimately, if we say that Christ is the head of the body, and then we go about making changes, what are we, in essence, doing to Jesus? We're kind of putting him to the side. We're substituting ourselves and making ourselves the head. Even if it's temporary, temporary, to, you know, authorize the, the creation of different things, because, well, Jesus would want us to do it. You know, yeah, he doesn't really give us the example of it, but he would want us to, to set up orphans. Those poor orphans and those poor widows. And, and are we saying that orphans and widows don't need help or people in need in our society don't need help? Are we saying that? No. But who's given the responsibility to take care of those things? We are. Okay, not, not as a congregation of God's people, but as individuals we are. It's not cruel or unloving for an entire congregation to recognize its restrictions and how it's, it uses or how it establishes its funds and, and organizations. That's not, that's not unloving. That's recognizing law. Okay? Just because something is good or helpful or nice for people doesn't mean that it's lawful. Even in our own society, our own government, that's important to remember. Okay, there's a lot of things you can do under the law, but there's some things you can't do. And if you want to be able to do it, what do you have to do? You're going to have to change the law. Okay, I mean, there are things, we have amendments for a reason. Things that are added in to recognize certain changes. And can we make amendments to God's word, though? No, we have no authority to do that. Any other thoughts or comments through that? All right. Uh, point four, congregations in the New Testament scriptures did all of their work and fulfilled their God-given mission without any human organizations. 
And one of the arguments that some make, and he's addressed this in previous lessons as well, is that in order for us to, to fulfill the commandments of God, we need this organization. Thus, it fulfills the, com the, the concept of a, an expediency. Remember, we talk about an expedient, songbooks, Lord's Supper trays, uh, pews, buildings. These are expedients that assist us in fulfilling the will of God. Okay? But if you take these away, can I still fulfill the will of God? Can I still worship? Sure. Okay, that's how you can test whether something is an expediency. If you can still take it away and you can still fulfill the commandments of God, it's an expediency because you haven't changed anything. You haven't done anything to the commandment of God. And so you are still within God's authority to be able to do what needs to be done. However, one of the arguments is about expediency in these benevolent institutions. In order to accomplish our goal, we have these benevolent organizations. First of all, there's a lack of understanding about what is within the purview of a congregation of God's people. Are the physical needs of an entire community the per within the purview and authority of a congregation of God's people? No. No, it's not. Again, that's not unloving. That's not hateful. That's recognizing the limitations God has placed. Okay, it's no different than than, you know, walking up to a federal government and asking for, for help with your rent or something like that. Even if they wanted to, could they? No, they don't have the ability to do that. They don't have the authority to just pay your rent for you. All right, there's, there's reasons for that. And the same applies to God's organization of the church. And so these human organizations uh, don't, they don't serve the purpose and they can't serve the purpose of doing that which the church is supposed to do. Because the New Testament church was able to do all those things without any or organizations or man-created organizations to assist it. It was all within the organization that God gave, and they were still able to do everything they needed to do. Thoughts or comments through that? And that goes back to authority, doesn't it? That goes back to authority, main to kind of understanding and individualizing what, or, 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 or kind of separating what a congregation can do and what an individual can do. And what they're, who is given the responsibility to do this and this. And just have a list. Okay, here's what God says the church is supposed to do and take care of. Here's what individuals are supposed to do and take care of. And, you know, you have to be able to separate those things that are, are different between the two. Thus, each congregation carried on its own work through the organization God gave it. There is not an instance in the scriptures where churches of Christ ever used any human organization as a medium through which to function in doing its work. It would be interesting for someone to point out anything that God gave the church to do that cannot be done through the local congregations divinely ordained. Uh, and I think what his point is, is if somebody who holds the view that these organizations help us in fulfilling the commandments of God and so forth, okay, point out, show me in scripture, any place that God gave the church something to do that can't be done through a local congregation. Because there's not a single thing. Right? Everything that is within the responsibility of a local congregation can be done within the design given in the New Testament. You don't need anything extra to do it. And despite the fact that some people are, well, times change and society changes, and so therefore we need these extra things to come in to, to help us with that. Well, that's like saying the Bible needs to be updated. I mean, there's no difference. Well, if you're going to say that about human institutions, you, why wouldn't you say that about salvation? Well, doesn't salvation need to be updated then? And I don't know that there's a whole lot of people who are going to argue that, uh, depending on their definition of salvation, I suppose. Uh, but... Um, Certainly, that, that speaks to the, the everlasting and, and ageless aspect of God's design. That it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, makes no difference what technological level we're at in our society or where we live. We can still fulfill all the commandments God has given us. Any other thoughts through point four? Point number five, scriptural objections to human organizations doing the work of the church. And so he's going to bring up a couple some examples of uh, within the Bible of, of objections to these things. Point A, he, or letter A, human organizations through which to do the Lord's work reflect upon the wisdom of God. 
And so the idea here is that basically you're saying that since we need these organizations to fulfill God's word, that means that God's wisdom fell short. Basically is what you're saying. That God's wisdom isn't enough. God's design isn't enough. And we as human beings have to help God out to make these uh, organizations fill the gap. Uh, human organizations supplant the church, usurp the functions God gave it, and ignore the divine pattern. And this goes back a little bit to the concept of, of uh, indulgences. Okay, The idea of, well, I'll give our money so that because the, the church organized and funded organization can then do the, do the dirty work of helping other people. Okay, well, I don't have to help other people because I gave my money to the church and then that money is going to the orphan's home. And so I'm helping orphans and I don't have to actually do anything. I just give my money. And, and it's virtually the same concept as an indulgence minus the concept of, well, you basically have to buy your way out of sin to make up for your sin. That's how the Catholic Church looked at it before with indulgences. Um, point C, human organizations defeat the purpose of God that each congregation by functioning according to the divine plan shall be built up to God's glory and honor. That it's all about God, that it's all about his wisdom, and when you insert man's organizations or human organizations, that defeats the whole purpose of the worship of God, of the recognition of God's glory and wisdom. Then it's about those organizations doing those things apart from God. It has nothing to do, even though you may have God's name in the name of the organization, doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it about God because you're still usurping his design. Anything through that one? Uh, point D, they ignore God's silence and lack of divine authority and thus violate the will of God by presumptuous sinning. And I think that that's very important that he mentions that. This isn't just... This isn't just a scenario where they're taking their souls into their own hands. You know, well, maybe it'll be all right. Maybe it'll be okay. Because by saying that, you're in essence saying, well, God doesn't care. Okay. Or maybe God won't care. You're allowing for that possibility. And yet, with the example of Nadab and Abihu, did God care? With Uzzah, did God care about his intentions? Good intentions. Did it keep him from being killed? Okay, time and time again, we have example in the Old and New Testaments, for that matter, where you can think to yourself and assume, well, God won't care about this. God won't care about that. And yet, time and time again, he shows that he does. And so when he says, ignoring God's silence, ignoring the divine authority of the church, doing their own thing, and thereby violating the will of God is presumptuous, it's arrogant, but it's also sin. And, and what is sin? How does John define sin in 1 John 3? It is the transgression of the law. That's sin. Okay? Well, did Nadab and Abihu, even though they did that which God had not commanded, did they violate the sanctity of the silence of the law? Yes. Even though God didn't say anything specific about whatever it was they did with this fire... They did that which God had not commanded, which meant it was to the exclusion of all else. And so they were presumptuous and they sinned. And Brother Cogdell rightly points out that even, quote unquote, churches of Christ that involve themselves in these types of efforts, it is sin. Even with the, and, and most of, these, most of these, these churches and congregations, they have the best of intentions. I recognize that. But that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it okay. And that's why it's important for us to be able to separate between the two. Now, people tell themselves, well, maybe it'll be okay. You know, God might make an exception. So you're going to live your life on the assumption that God's going to make an exception. When did God ever make an ex exception anywhere in the New Testament or Old Testament for that matter? When somebody ignored his authority? No. Judgment may not have come immediately, but he always punished them for ignoring his authority. Always. So we don't just get to, to, to run the table or, or uh, roll the dice and say, well, maybe God will make, make an exception here. You're going to gamble your soul when every example tells you that God doesn't like that. <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, number one under, or, or letter E, rather, 
Such organizations are an addition to God's divine arrangement and to his word and do not classify as an aid or expedient in the divine plan. He brings up uh, number one, instrumental music is not an aid, but an addition because there's no authority for its use. It does not come within the scope of that which God has commanded. Instrumental music is not required for us to sing, is it? People like instrumental music. They like to listen to the instrumental music. It makes them feel things and that sort of thing. But does God want instrumental music? Does he ask for instrumental music? No. No, he doesn't. He wants us to sing. Therefore, by us adding instrumental music, even along with our singing, we are presumptuously sinning. We are arrogant and assuming God will be okay with it because we want it. And it's about what can I get out of where it's not about God. I know a lot of people use that as an excuse. Oh, well, but God will be glorified and, and it'll make God happy to hear these things. You are putting man's thought process and desires on God. No, it's not about God. It's about you. I want to hear the end. Oh, I love the instrumental music. It's so beautiful. And yeah, sometimes it is. Amazing Grace on Bagpipes has always stuck with me since Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. I mean, it, 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 that sometimes even when we sing Amazing Grace, I have to physically keep my, my brain in check not hearing that playing when Spock died. It was terrible. But that doesn't make it okay. That doesn't make it something that we can do as a congregation of God's people to be involved in. Thoughts or comments through that? All right. He brings up a chart. Uh, Brother Cogdell was kind of keen on charts here. Uh, he brings up the fact that you've got the church, the organization, and then you have from the church, uh, the organization of the church, the funds from the congregation going to a missionary society or a sponsoring church situation, home for the elderly or, or children's home, which kind of falls under the concept of ministry or administering to. That's what ministry means. Uh, edification society, which would be like a, a preacher training school type of thing or or even a, a church school kind of thing that would apply as well. And he says, this is not, uh, this is not how it's supposed to work. All right. Uh, we will stop there. We will pick up here uh, with this second point that he brings up. We're almost done with lesson 10. So we will quickly finish lesson 10 next week and move on to lesson 11, which is the work of the church involving evangelism. Thank you, everybody.